Hello, Blogging Heads Nation. Uh, I am Daniel Dresner uh, from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and I blog at foreignpolicy.com. And I am the very shamefaced Heather Hurlbert at the National <laughs> Security Network, who blogs at Democracy Arsenal, um, tweets at NACSEC, NATSEC Heather, and proved herself to be such a disastrous uh, non non Jedi master of 21st century technology that a brilliant hour of uh, blogging heads uh, repartee between Dan and myself, including the best humble brag in all time and the second best humble brag of all time, were lost uh, lost to your to your listening ears a week ago. My dear readers, I, we cannot possibly recreate the the awesomeness that was that that humble it's brag a tragedy session. But let's on just par with the loss of the Alexandria Library. I have to agree, but I mean, let's just say that various, you know, at various points, John Huntsman's name was dropped by both of us, as well as, you know, multiple name dropping of when I was at the White House. And I'm not going to say it was who it was by, but, you know, <laughs> it, it was epic. It was on an epic level. And, you know, by the time you would have finished that hour, you would have either, you know, have just been laughing or have been throwing things at your computer screen. But it was happening, truly. Yeah. I, I, Basically, I indulged, I, in, I indulged in a whole spree of Washington, Washingtonian behavior that I normally mock and make fun of. So I, I think we have to conclude that the gods were punishing me. That might very well be it. Um, but we can, we can actually continue the conversation that we were having last week, the the, the topic du jour back then was basically sort of uh, Mitt Romney's foreign policy acumen. And as it turns out, uh, the NATO summit, which uh, – has it concluded? It ha yeah. You, you didn't even yeah, notice, had, uh, did you? It, well, I mean, let's be honest, you know. I mean, <laughs> really, name me one eventful – one thing of, uh, of import that happened at the summit. Um, I, I will say that uh, the, the class – the NATO summit always reminds me, Alan Beatty a couple of years ago – wrote a, uh, a great little sort of generic news, like mock news reportage of what happens with the summit, you know, any kind of summit communique that Gideon Rockman once posted on, on the Financial Times. And it, it, it has this wonderful line, like, we we're very seriously concerned about this serious outbreak of seriousness. You know, and it, it, it just perfectly captures any G8 or NATO summit, uh, you know, in perpetuity. Um, but that said, Romney wrote a, a op-ed uh, in the Chicago Tribune, I believe, uh, on this summit, and, and I suspect you didn't like it. Well, you know, the, the first thing that I found astonishing about the, the Romney response was the statement that uh, the campaign put out, which didn't mention Afghanistan. Um, that, of course, one of the main subjects of discussion at the summit was Afghanistan, that uh, Alliance and other foreign forces are giving an extra 39,000 troops that mean 39,000 Americans don't have to be in Afghanistan, and yet there was no mention of it, which... I have to say, I mean, I can be snide all day about it, but I conclude that the reason was that there wasn't agreement among the the warring factions of Romney advisors on what to say about the alliance's agreement to on sort of how they're steadily and, and jointly moving toward the exits, and so thus it was better to leave it out. But it just it, it, it was a sort of evidence of fundamental non-seriousness about, you know, what are we using this alliance for, and we can't even talk, or one of our two political parties can't even talk about what we're using it for. Yes, uh, that was a bit problematic. I mean, I went to town on, on uh, the op-ed as well. Um, it, it really, I don't know how to put this. I mean, I don't have a problem with, with I do have a problem with it, but, you know, I, I, I kind of I shrug off sort of, you know, hyper-hawkish rhetoric during the campaign because I'm not sure how much it really counts for. I, I think the thing that I did find a little disturbing about the, the NATO op-ed was the total lack of logic that was going on in that thing. I, there's just no other way to put it because he was saying, he was saying, so NATO is broken, you know, which is a fair, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, he's fair to say that there, there's there's problems in NATO, and, and I don't disagree with, with the, some of the diagnosis, but you know, he said, so the way to cure it is, first, Europe needs to spend more on defense, and second, the U.S. needs to spend more on defense, and that'll solve everything, um, which. I'm not entirely sure he understands how NATO traditionally has worked, which is whenever the U.S. ramps up its military spending, generally the allies are going to think, oh, great, we don't need to you know, worry about this. Uh, so they're not going to spend anything necessarily. Um, and not to mention that he was talking about NATO you know, playing a role in North Korea and countering China. And, you know, I understand out of theater operations, but, but I can put it no other way than saying what the fuck. 
Well, I actually think you may have hit on a really fantastic idea for a second term Obama. Should should we have such a thing? Which is that um, we could he could uh, he could appoint Romney as a special envoy for burden sharing. Um, and he could uh, he could go around Europe and use his uh, use his Bain consulting expertise to explain to the Europeans how they should be um, handling their defense better and spending more money. And I'm sure he'd uh, I'm sure he'd find as welcome and hospitable um, a response to that as uh, Secretary Gates did uh, when he went around Europe, both for his Republican president boss and his Democratic president. I mean, look, you know, you you know as well as I do, that trying to get the Europeans to spend more money on their own defense is is the bane of the existence of every president and his Europe staff. Um, and yeah. so, you know, that was that's kind of a cheap applause line. Um, in my sort of old-fashioned, you know, you don't say rude things about guests while they're in your house, it was a tacky applause line to use while the Allies were here. Um, it was further mendacious because of the rhetoric suggesting that somehow President Obama is responsible for the sequester and for the cuts of uh, the defense cuts that are threatened in the sequester, where, you know, right. my memory tells me that that was a, a bright idea that they had up in Congress. Yeah, that's a fair point. I hope. And, uh, it was certainly valid. You know, and I just, I kept imagining myself a European sitting in Chicago reading that and trying to think what I was going to, you know, how I was going to explain to my, um, to my leadership. Um, what the hell this actually meant and what it meant that we should be planning for in the event of a, of a Romney election, which, you know, gets to um, a topic that you and I were, were debating a little bit about on Twitter earlier today um, that uh, Aaron Miller over at Foreign Policy yeah. has published an article uh, referring to something called the Barack O'Romney Foreign Policy, uh, saying that um, the foreign policy of the two is basically indistinguishable, which, which I actually object to on substantive grounds. <laughs> um, and I will I will go into greater length on that. But there is also the question: if, say, on Iran, on Afghanistan, um, one candidate can't actually enunciate a policy alternative that, when you get past all the rhetoric, sounds very different. How how much does political rhetoric? How much does campaign rhetoric actually matter? I am making a giant zero uh, sign at the camera. I, I think I, 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 this has been a consistent theme of mine, um, which is I really don't think that that. I don't think that campaign promises on foreign policy, and let me be very clear here, I'm making a distinction between foreign policy and domestic policy. I think the campaign pledges of domestic policy actually do count for a fair amount because voters remember that stuff. Voters don't care about foreign policy, let's be blunt. Um, and so as a result, you know, I, I do think that by and large what campaigns say about foreign policy doesn't in the end matter that much. Um, you know, I mean, and again, let's go back to what happened in 2008. You know, we've, I think we've had this conversation before. But, you know, if, if Barack Obama had actually implemented the foreign policy that he claimed he was going to in 2008, you know, I think the U.S. would have renegotiated NAFTA. Uh, you know, Obama would have been happy to have sat down with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. Um, to be fair, he did say he would go into Pakistan to get bin Laden. So you got to give him credit on that one. That was a, that was a campaign pledge he actually kept to. Um, and, and I think, you know, kudos for that one. Um, but, you know, I, I think there's two levels on this. The first is is that, let's face it, campaigns often say a lot of things on foreign policy. They never have any intention of implementing. This is entirely an exercise in pleasing various constituencies in their own uh, party. And then there are the times where perhaps the rhetoric is actually genuinely intended. In other words, the candidate or some, whoever's you know coming up with the, the rhetoric really does think they're going to do that. But what happens is that even if they make even a slight move towards implementing it, the cruel shoals of foreign policy reality hit them in the face, at which point they then realize that even if they want to do this policy, like let's say, I don't know, closing down Guantanamo Bay, it's not going to happen for a whole variety of political realities, both domestic and international. Um, I'm sorry, no, ahead. I would just add one category to what you're saying, which is that, okay. um, and, and the Obama campaign in 08 was a, was, were masters at this, um, of um, making statements that suggested a really different approach without necessarily pledging. So, for example, Obama never said he would sit down with Ahmadinejad without any precondition, you know, that he would sort of on tick. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. in fact, I think you can argue um, that what they've done, you know, that they made some attempts and what they got were the terrible 09 elections, which pretty much made it impossible to sit down with anybody. Um, you know, that I, that, that I think they could make a strong case that what they've done is pretty consistent with what they've said they would do. But um, 
and you see you see the Romney people trying to do that this time around to not actually promise to do things that at least some people on the advisory team know to be crazy like for example mm-hmm. say you know on my first day in office we will we will bomb um, you know pick your favorite nuclear site in Iran but at the same time trying to ratchet up the rhetoric to please the domestic constituency groups that you're that you're talking about and right. this is where I disagree with you because foreigners care about foreign policy insofar as it tends to be their domestic policy. So, you know, there is, I think, I mean, one sort of ripped from the headlines example is today um, you have negotiations opening up um, with Iran and the, the so called P5 plus one group of international um, interlocutors, which look like they went pretty well and look like they're opening up a process and the two sides have exchanged proposals and counterproposals and no one's hair is on fire, which suggests, okay, yes, but okay. at the same time... <laughs> I have to say that's a low level of, of standard to define success, but I will grant you they, they seem more promising than they've seen in question. You know, we're just out of the habit of watching how diplomacy works, and that is how diplomacy <laughs> works. You know, the it doesn't okay. suck standard is, is really not to be uh, not to be minimized. Sorry for that. That was inappropriate. Uh, sorry for the children in the audience. <laughs> Um, but um, I dropped the f bomb earlier. I mean, come on, you're you are you are very <laughs> um, But um, at the same time, you know, how are the Iranians supposed to understand some of these key Romney advisors? Um, with a piece in the Wall Street Journal today, basically saying, eh, you know, negotiations, there's no point here. We should absolutely, there should be no flexibility. There should be no ability to respond to anything. There should be no easing up on the sanctions. And that that piece makes total sense in the context of a campaign and trying to put Obama in a political box. And, you know, it's a reasonable strategy from a Republican point of view. I see why they're doing it. But if you're actually trying to have negotiations and make the Iranians believe that in exchange for giving us what we want, they can have something they want, that's a terrible way. It's a terrible way to, to run a business. So so it does have it does have effects. It has effects on the Israelis. It has effects on the Europeans who, you know, we were, I was just um, thinking the other day that that incredible set of discussions in the primaries, I think, that was kicked off by Herman Cain saying, if I were president, you know, we would need to bail out Europe. And like, obviously that's not serious and no serious person yeah. is going to pay attention to that. But then that pushed Romney into a more problematic position on Europe where, you know, every banker that's supporting Romney knows in his or her heart that if the euro really started to go down the drain, we'd have to step in for the sake of our own banking sector, right? Those guys all know that as much as it pains them. But Mm -hmm. to the extent that the European markets start to believe that maybe there's some doubt about whether a Romney administration would do that, that potentially has really lousy consequences that that uh, that bite you and me in the pocketbook. So, you know, the, the rhetoric on foreign policy is not as free as we like to think that it is. Okay, I will push back on you very strongly because I think you're actually adopting a very... You're, you, I think you're actually way underestimating the, the acumen of, in fact, the rest of the world when it comes to U.S. campaign rhetoric. I mean, this is not their first go-around when it comes to a presidential election. You know, so for example, I, I, first of all, let's bear in mind, even during the, you know, like during the 2008 campaign, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, was it Austin Goolsby that got into trouble because it was revealed that he had talked to a Canadian official and actually said, yeah, of course the NAFTA stuff is rhetoric. We're not really going to, you know, open that up for negotiation. Ah, uh, yes, you know, I had forgotten that. Yes. So, you know, first of all, I mean, there's actual direct things. So my hunch is the Europeans are not wigged out at all about this because, Probably the, the if there is a Sato Voce message, the Sato Voce message is look, we're just running a campaign here, um, you know, and we can say the situation has changed when we're elected. So I'm not worried about that. And even the Iranians, I would argue, you know, I, I grant you they might view you know the United States through a somewhat different lens, um, but you know even they, you know, are probably right because they're right now in the middle of doing it domestically. Recognize the difference between talking domestically versus what actually happens when they're in power. Um, so I grant you that, that occasionally rhetorical things, you know, make the ground a little tougher to, to, to patch up. And by that standard, you really, in that sense, do have to give Romney credit because he has managed to piss off China, Russia, and Europe. Um, so, you know, in the span of two months, which is pretty cool if you think about it. I mean, you know. Okay, so here's, it, it, here's my question for you. 
if you yeah. if you assume a Romney presidency, right, then you okay. assume something of a tidal wave that that changes sort of the the very close, slightly favoring Obama numbers that we've been seeing for a while, and you assume that with that tidal wave comes a Republican tidal wave that takes over the Senate and maintains the majority yeah. in the House. Okay. okay. Now think about who those people are. Okay, those candidates, those incumbents, and then think about that those are the people at whom this rhetoric is directed. And, um, you know, yes, um, I believe that, you know, as I said, Mitt Romney in his heart knows that we'd have to bail out, that we'd have to, we'd have to support Europe if they needed it economically, um, knows in his heart that when the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is saying it's not a good idea to bomb Iran, that it's really not a good idea to bomb Iran. Can I, can I just say, you, I think you've come up with a great new campaign pledge or, or slogan for the Romney campaign. You know, in his heart, you know he's saying. <laughs> in his heart, you know. Yeah, we're, we're, we're betraying our age, though, Dresner. Um, true, for those of you, for those of you who don't know the reference, that's um, Barry Goldwater. Um, whose slogan yeah. was it about Goldwater? In your heart, it, Goldwater's slogan was "In your heart, you know he's right." In your heart, you know he's right. And his yeah, opponent's yeah. slogan was "In your heart, you know he's nuts." Um, yeah, and I yeah. hasten to add that I was, um, I was um, the child of political parents, and although I certainly was unaware of this at the time, I was uh, drinking it in. Ha! I was not even alive then. So. <laughs> Um, gotcha, Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, Dresner. When were you born? I was born in sixty. Yeah, so was I. Okay, yeah, this is sixty-four. Yeah. In okay. utero, man. Right. In utero. Yes. <laughs> okay. Go yeah, ahead. I was born. I was born with with actually my my son will claim you know he was he was not a Redskins or sorry he was not a Red Sox fan in like nineteen ninety nine or something and I'll say well of course you weren't. You know, you were you weren't even a twinkle in your parents' eye at that point. But but he right, he thinks right. his sports allegiances are, are sort of retroactive before his birth. Um, <laughs> what's the more serious point I was trying to make? Um, that um, so anyway, those folks are going to get to town, and um, as Obama found out with oh, right, Guantanamo, right, okay. you know, they are going to have some say over what happens and what doesn't happen, and the rhetoric, the rhetorical expectations that that Romney is. Um, you know, in the same way that a lot of Obama supporters think they heard him say things that he didn't quite exactly say and were very disappointed yeah. that he didn't do those things. Um, you know, Romney's going to have some trouble with the people who are going to be in control of the House and the Senate, the same ones that have been giving, you know, Boehner fits. And and they they take this rhetoric seriously. They're the ones, as you said, that it's aimed at. So, I again, it just... Okay, I'll push back again, because I, I, I understand your points, and, and I think you're right that in some ways what matters is not just whether Romney wins, but whether he also controls Congress. And if um, he does, he that, will. There's, there's no scenario under which Romney wins and doesn't control Congress. Okay. I, I think there are two ways to think about this. The first is, is that in contrast, again, to domestic policy, I think the GOP is a little more split on foreign policy. Um, so as a result, I don't think there's a uniform foreign policy approach that, that you're going to see in Congress, because I mean, in some ways it's divided very strongly um, between, let's say, the sort of neocon hawks versus what I can only describe, not, not exactly Ron Paul types, but certainly people that have had their fill of war and simply, you know, are, are almost, you know, not isolationists, that's not right, the, exactly the right word, but people who simply don't want to, you know, bother getting involved in, a, in another sort of long-term and costly military operation overseas. So I think Romney, that gives Romney some space to maneuver. The second thing is, is that, it, and this might be, this, maybe this is an asymmetric constraint. I don't think Republican presidents are as bound or as hampered by Congress as Democrats are. Um, that is a really I, interesting theory that I would love to test out in some alternate universe where I didn't have to live in the country while it was happening. Um, all right, but I, but no, your first your first point. Um, the party is absolutely divided, um, but Congress not so much. And um, you know, as you, as you you saw last week, we had the extraordinary spectacle of the Senate leadership pulling an amendment um, asking the president to hasten the withdrawal from Afghanistan because they were scared it would pass. Um, and so there you had you know the neocons saying, okay, you know Ron Paul Republicans, you've had your fun now, shut up and go home. Um, mm -hmm. And that happened on on issue after issue in the the voting on the Defense Authorization Act, where you had an alliance of Democrats and Tea Party Republicans and the Republican leadership monitoring very carefully to make sure that no no amendment where that alliance was too strong was allowed to come to a vote. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I, I, I still don't. I mean, look this way. First of all, and you know as well as I do that an awful lot of the foreign policy, uh, an awful the president controls a lot of foreign policy without even needing to go to Congress. Um, and second, that I don't think. I think Romney can live with a certain amount of foreign policy criticism from his right, I guess would be the way to put it. And indeed, in some ways, it actually helps him if he gets that criticism because it makes him seem like the moderate, you know, calm leader above all. Um, and also, as I said, I think the second point, and here I'm not, I, I'm, I'm literally sort of developing this in real time. I really do think that, and maybe this will change post Obama, but for a long period of time, Democrats constantly had, you know, when they were in, in power, had to be afraid of looking weak. Um, in terms of foreign policy crisis. The notion was that they didn't take defense seriously, um, you know, they didn't take security seriously. That, I think, you know, to Obama's credit, that advantage has been erased. But for a long period of time, that was what they always had to worry about with dealing with Congress. I think Republicans always got a free pass on that. Um, and so in that sense, I don't think Romney's going to be any different. Well, it would, as I say, it would be fascinating to see as a political science experiment. I, I, uh, it won't surprise anyone to know that I'm hoping to not actually have to see it. Um, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, back to Aaron Miller's original thesis, um, as much yeah. as I love Aaron, there, there are two things that I really object to. And one is that anytime you get to this place of just words don't matter, I think we're in, we're in a dangerous place. And yes, I know it's politics and whatever, but, you know, words do matter. And then okay. the, the last thing that I think has to be said is, is that it's, it's, it's fun to have this kind of blasé, I'm so sophisticated, I notice there's no difference. But um, if you happen to be one of the thousands of women around the world who relies on U.S. family planning assistance and would be affected okay. by the global gag rule, you know, there damn well is a difference. Um, you know, if you think that... Um, calling the Russians, you know, geopolitical enemy number one. And, and there, I actually think that, given that Romney has over and over again come out with these kind of truly crazy positions on Russia and arms control with Russia and working with Russia, then, you know, that you, you can't you can't write that one off as, as um, pandering for domestic benefit anymore after it's been done that many times. So I would argue there actually, there are some significant differences and you know, they matter for real people and real people's lives, and they matter geopolitically. Okay, I would, I mean, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to this. I'll try to defend Miller's uh, thesis in, in two ways. Um, the first is, I think one of his points, which I, I, I think you would probably concede, is that to some extent his point is really not so much about Romney, but rather in some ways the continuity between, let's say, the second term of George W. Bush and then what Barack Obama did on a whole variety of issues. And in some ways, the, the surprise isn't so much that, you know, that Romney is like Obama, but rather that Obama has pursued a fair number of policies that conservatives actually, by and large, are pretty comfortable with. Um, and also, I think one of the things, Miller didn't say this, but I think he should have, which is one of the reasons why they look similar is less about the parties and more about the overwhelming public consensus of no more wars. So, you know, in, in some ways, first of all, I mean, Obama has been, you know, very aggressive in terms of, of prosecuting the war on terror and, you know, been certainly successful. But the other thing is, is that he's also been very aggressive in getting you know, the United States out of Iraq and, you know, setting up the stage for the United States to get out of Afghanistan. And those are overwhelmingly popular policies um, to the point where even if Romney doesn't want to do them, I think he probably will do them. Um, and, you know, these are big, significant things in terms of, 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 you know, going to war or not. So I think that's a very large area where, in fact, they actually do have something in common. Or the political constraints are so powerful that they have no choice but to have something in common. Well, there's a structural argument that, that Miller doesn't quite make and that you're making a little more explicitly, which is that um, yeah. the most fundamental determinants of American foreign policy are not elections. Um, and that, I think, you know, is a, is a point that, that can't be repeated often enough, um, that, that the American foreign policy is about, is about things other than, other than elections. And you can take that in a Marxist direction. You can take it in a vulgar Marxist direction. You can take it in, in all kinds of directions. But, but yeah. Um, but the other point, which I think, again, you know, back to my words matter, is mm -hmm. that some of the stuff that happened in second-term Bush again happened 
not so much because it was what the administration wanted to do, and certainly not but so much. But they had much, no choice. Yeah, they had no choice. Not so much yeah. because of it was what their conservative intellectuals wanted to do, and certainly, I mean, we see, you know, in many ways, Republicans running away from second-term Bush and running away from the second-term Bush advisors, frankly, as yeah. fast as they can. Whereas um, the Obama policies actually do, you know, what they're doing actually does fit with a worldview about, you know, sort of approaching the world with a willingness to negotiate, a willingness to look at others' interests, a willingness to conceive of ourselves as part of a collective leadership instead of the only, you know, the only decision maker in leadership, and the desire to bring to the table as part of that the ability to use use overwhelming force in, in times and places of our, of our choosing. And, and those, those two elements together are how I would characterize the Obama foreign policy. And that's actually, that's profoundly different from the core worldview of Bush and even more that you see in the, in the Republican rhetoric now, even though the external constraints led them to, led them to a lot of the same places. Well, I would say the following thing. You've actually hit upon the one area where I might agree with you in terms of where uh -oh. they're different. Change the subject yes. immediately. Exactly. But, uh, you know, in frustration because our, our, our blogging heads last time didn't get published, I wrote a post, you know, basically saying, talking about sort of turmoil or disorganization or lack of coherence in the Romney foreign policy team last week. And I thought, the, you know, and I, I basically made these arguments that I, I think on the whole this stuff doesn't really matter that much. But there is one exception. Um, and that is, and I, I would have dismissed this out of hand a month ago, and I don't dismiss it quite as out of hand now, based on what I'm hearing. If Romney were to appoint someone like, let's say, John Bolton as Secretary of State, yeah, that would actually make a difference. Okay, uh, you know, Bolton's worldview is just a bit out there, um, and also, as someone who had to peruse his memoirs uh, for some research at one point, Holy crap, those memoirs scare the crap out of me. Um, because there is a borderline delusional aspect to them. Have you ever, have you ever perused both I memoirs? have not, and I salute you as a great American for making the sacrifice and doing that. Well, I mean, to be fair, I, I was doing some research on PSI, the Proliferation Security Initiative, and, you know, Bolton yep. did play a role in that. Um, but, you know, I, I, so I read that part of it, and then I couldn't stop, like, perusing it. Because, seriously, the, the, I... I I, it's hard for me to describe the way these memoirs are set up. But basically, they make it's kind of like the conservative doppelganger to, to Robert Reich is locked in the cabinet. Um, you know, if you remember, Reich wrote this memoir about his time as Secretary of Labor during the Clinton years that, you know, he would describe scenes and then there would actually, those scenes, you would, as it turned out, had been videotaped on like C-SPAN or something, and they bear no resemblance to the way Reich described them. Reich sort of has them as being, you know, much more extreme, and it's kind of you kind of got that sense with Bolton. Bolton's memoirs consist of the following: an issue comes up, little delivered State Department folk, you know, propose abject surrender to the Chinese immediately. Bolton, however, stands firm and suggests a much more robust, you know, unilateral pro-American response. The Secretary of State, either via Powell or Rice, like, oh, I don't know if we can do this. I'm not sure that's a great idea. Bolton carries the day somehow, and then inevitably what happens is that either Powell or Rice go into Bolton's office and say, yeah, you were right. I'm sorry. You're a great American. I, you know, how could I have not realized that? I, I mean, and, and there is just no way any of this, you know, played, went down the way it did. Um, but if that is actually the way he sees the world, we're, and, and he were to become Secretary of State, it would be the most interesting and by interesting, I mean batshit scary Secretary of State since Al Haig um, is the only way I would describe it. I, um, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to say that John Bolton is not going to be Secretary of State. And that in itself would, would present its own sort of interesting and painful conundrum if Romney were to be elected, watching them um, try to figure out what they would do with him. Right. Um, I mean, I think that's the only place he could go. I mean, he, he's already been UN ambassador. Yeah. Um, he wouldn't take a deputy position. He would be—he'd be a horrible subordinate. How um, old is he? he? Can't, I honestly don't know. I want to say sixty. So, so young like enough that there's not an argument that he needs to graduate to the senior statesman role, which is how one sometimes deals with with people who fit in that category. Yeah. And he—I mean—he would be a horrible NSC advisor or something like that. I mean, that would just be disastrous. I, it, maybe you're right. I mean, all I can tell you is—is is that I—I I, I would have agreed with you. There was a zero chance a month ago. The rumblings I have heard 
Okay, but this seems, I have to say, this is wildly inconsistent. On the one hand, you say, don't worry, Romney's rhetoric doesn't matter, and then you say, I'm worried that he's going to appoint John Bolton Secretary of State. I mean, pick which one it is. Well, Secretary of State actually does have, you know, significant operational policy authority. So I do think a point, you know, who you appoint does matter a fair amount in terms of determining foreign policy. And yes, I will grant that words matter to some extent once you actually get into office. My argument before this has been what you say during the campaign does not necessarily mean all that much once you get into office. Once you get into office, if you shoot your mouth off, yeah, that's a problem. I'm, I'll completely concede that point. Words do matter once you actually have authority. I don't think they matter as much at the campaign stage. But words matter because they are indicative of things like whether you would actually consider naming John Bolton Secretary of State, which we both agree would matter. And so I, you know, I just am not in favor of blowing off the words now because, you know, the argument yeah, that I think okay. you're now making is the fact that so many Bolton-esque words are coming out of the Romney campaign is part of some things that you're taking as an indicator that they might actually be willing to... Um, to put Romney, I mean, to put Romney, to put Bolton, Bolton in yeah. in its state, and and that you know, to me, that just makes that just makes my argument for me right there. But I guess I, I think what we're disagreeing about is the causal mechanism. You're saying the words matter because they tick off foreign countries, or because it means that no, I'm saying the words matter because they reflect a reality that they're not just, okay. I mean, sort of picked up and going to be discarded. You know, there's there's a I guess there's a difference between. Um, and I'm trying to think of a Republican thing so that I can be consistent and not seem like I'm excusing Democratic behavior and condoning Republican behavior. There's a difference between, um, okay, Romney on China, how's this? Romney says okay. that he will, um, you know, start um, doing more punitive measures, uh, trade measures against China on his first right. day in office. Nobody yeah. believes he will actually do that. Um, and the Chinese, you know, who, um, as you said, this is not the first presidential campaign they have watched. The Chinese presumably yeah. don't believe it either. So that one, right. I, I'm, I'm with you completely. If, however, okay. you have a string of Bolton-esque pronouncements coming out of the candidate's mouth, at the same time that you have this behind the scenes, sort of, well, not very behind the scenes, you know, Romney advisors running to New York Times reporters, for God's sake, and saying, yeah. what the hell are we going to do? We can't control our candidate. John Bolton keeps hijacking our policy papers. Then... You know, the words are, the rhetoric is a data point about reality. I, I, I grant you that the words to date suggest that at the minimum the Romney campaign is Bolton curious, um, <laughs> would be the way I would put it. <laughs> okay, that, that's a, just a bunch of really regrettable images. <laughs> that's just, that's, yeah, it's really going to ruin the rest of my afternoon right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to need a minute to compose this. <laughs> Okay. I'm also going to ponder what the what the PG what the PG link could possibly be for that. <laughs> I, I don't even want to go there. <laughs> okay, okay, so let me rescue you by pointing you, out please. that we do have um, just today, as I mentioned, we have a fabulous um, actual real time negotiation going on with real live Iranians um, sitting in a room with real live Americans. Um, in Baghdad, in Baghdad of all things. Um, yes. You know, you poor old, poor Wendy Sherman who gets the North Korea account, the Iran account, and then where does she get to do the Iran account? In Iraq. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, you just you just wonder what she what sin she committed in a past life. Yeah, I was going to say, there, there'd better be a nice, like, plum, you know, ambassadorship to the Bahamas or something after this. Yeah, well, this is, I mean, just back to the problem we were just saying about Bolton. After you've been um, the number three official at the State Department, you know, it's it's, it's like kind of hard to reward you. you yeah. Know, your, your reward is that you become like Tom Pickering, an elder statesman, going around issuing words of wisdom that people don't pay enough attention to. Um, right. But um, anyway, so... So this is happening, and the good news is that they seem to have agreed to meet for a second day, that, as I said earlier, they seem to have exchanged proposals and nobody's hair was on fire. Um, the bad news is that this is diplomacy and it works really slowly, and there's a lot of pressure on this problem to be resolved quickly, and expectations that are, are very, very high um, for a process that's going to be fraught and there are going to be... Um, missteps along the way, and you know yeah. both sides will probably try to back out of any agreement at least once. I would. I mean, here's my barometer for the state of the negotiations in Baghdad. The more agitated the Israelis are, I assume the better they're going. That's basically going to be my uh, my Geiger counter on this one. 
um, so that the more the Israelis say, this is unacceptable, I can't believe this, what the hell, you know, we've been, we've been thrown under a bus. You know, the moment they say we've been thrown under a bus, that's when you know the negotiations have succeeded. Um, because uh, it means they realize a, ne a negotiated settlement might actually be possible. Um, you know, I, I will say that there's been a little more optimism on this than you know than you've heard uh, do, during previous rounds. I would argue that the, the the need for speed on this is not just on the West side, though. It's also on the Iranian side, which is they really, really, really don't want uh, a variety of EU sanctions to kick in come July 1st. I think particularly they don't want the shipping ones to come in because um, one of the things that will happen is, is that uh, most of the shipping insurance in the world is done through London and basically all of those shipping registries have made it clear they will not insure ships carrying Iranian oil going to countries like China and South Korea uh, which would essentially tighten the embargo even though th that was perhaps a, a more effective uh, punch than anyone an had anticipated. Uh, my understanding is one of the things, one of the carrots that the, the P5 plus one is holding out is to say, look, we will offer a waiver for those, um, provided you guys don't enrich past 20, or, you know, you don't, you pledge not to enrich up to 20%. Um, but I have to say, to date, everything looks like the groundwork has at least been laid for something reasonably positive, because the Iranians are talking smack domestically, which is often what they'll do right before they make a concession. Um, and as you say, the negotiations didn't end today in a horrible way. So, you know, that, that offers the promise of more of these things. Um, I think the interesting question is, how does this get framed, as you point out, by the media? If they're, What does success look like beyond the Israelis being pissed? So one um, just actual factual data point that I saw today that I, I thought was really interesting. Hey, I offered lots of factual data points. No, before. I want to add ahead. one factual data point before okay, we go you. to framing and messaging, which okay. was okay, um, okay. a piece in Al Monitor saying that um, the financial market situation in Tehran is the worst it has been since the last days of the Iran-Iraq war. And yeah. okay. what's, I mean, both what, if you think about sort of how awful, you know, that was a 10-year conflict in which, yeah. um, you know, press ganged teenagers were sent to the front without weapons. So you think about how right. bad that was. But second, you know, that war ended with a negotiated solution that the Iranians were very reluctant to accept, but ultimately did accept for purposes right. of the survival of the state. So, um, Which is what they will do if the survival of the state yes, is expected. Yes, and so yes. that, I actually think that's a very interesting and, and relevant and, and um, comparison that, that one hopes one hopes bodes well. Um, and as far as the, the framing is, is concerned, you know, I've been, and forgive me if I said this on, on blogging heads before, but um, in the U.S. domestic context, as you said earlier, Americans don't want another war. And you've yeah. seen again and again in the polling that Americans don't want to go to war with Iran unless, um, you know, there's the feeling that war is imminent and Iran has a weapon. Um, Americans don't want the Israelis to, to take action unilaterally. And, and this actually remarkably has stayed pretty consistent through all the political backing and forthing, um, although there are, there are big partisan divides on it. So, so to me, the question about the framing is really whether um, that sort of basic public desire to see this get played out peacefully, the Pentagon's desire to see it get played out peacefully, um, whether that can be matched up with any understanding of just how sort of slow and uneven and ugly and messy diplomacy actually is, and, and you know whether we're whether we're sort of ready for this kind of diplomacy in the in the Twitter age. And you know, on our on, on the fabulous Lost episode, we talked a little bit about how Twitter oh, right. Twitter affected the the Chen Guangchen situation. Yeah. And if you think a little bit about how you know what happens when they first go back to Tehran and the first organ in Tehran says, you know, we think this is a bad idea. And there will immediately be an explosion of, see, we told you so here. And it'll be mm -hmm. very interesting to see how that plays out and whether, you know, sort of, I think you have basic acceptance among all non-political segments of American society that a negotiated solution and a sort of slowing things down so solution is the right one, given the general war weariness and, and regional instability. But the you know the ability to use Twitter to trump that is something that I really wonder about. I mean, I think it's I, I do think it's a deeper issue though, which is essentially let's face it, any kind of negotiated settlement 
And, you know, let's assume, I'll be optimistic and say, okay, there's an arrangement whereby basically the Iranians will, you know, agree to safeguards that pretty much guarantee they're not at least going to be developing a weapon, but they will have, have some, probably some sort of nuclear processing or, or, you know, some sort of low-grade arrangement. But the issue is, is that the deal essentially is one in which the Obama administration or the, the P5 plus one is making a deal with the current regime, thereby recognizing the current regime's right to exist. Um, and that, I mean, let's face it, that is the thing that, you know, causes Israelis to get twitchy and that causes a lot of conservatives to get twitchy. Um, go ahead. Yeah, no, there's, it's interesting and there's, um, I, I guess there's a, a relatively new, uh, or foreign affairs was anyway trying to remarket as new, a debate on this subject. But, you know, mm -hmm. there just isn't, um, there just, it, nobody has been able to put forward a um, a strategy on Iranian regime change that shows any prospect of working in the short to medium term. And when yeah, you talk granted. to okay. the Iranian dissidents and human rights activists and opposition political leaders that, in principle, are the government that, that the U.S. and Israelis and, you know, in general, just people who care about human rights and people not being tortured and executed without trial and underage and all the rest of it, the folks that we'd prefer to see in charge, you know, what they will say to you is, we don't want military action, we don't want lots of aggressive rhetoric about regime change, because frankly, that just entrenches the hold of the existing regime, and we'd, we'd like mm -hmm. you to, we'd like you to speak up about human rights violations, we don't want you to be silent on human rights violations, but as far as the political transition goes, we'd, we'd kind of like you to keep your hands off a little bit and let us, let us work that out for ourselves, which really ought to be something that makes sense to Americans, because God knows we don't like people intervening in our politics. Yes, but still, again, you're talking about trying to cut this kind of negotiation during a campaign, you know, during a presidential election campaign. In some ways, any kind of deal that is cut is going to force Romney to reject it and say what we should be doing is changing the regime, um, and which is great, of course, because if you're running a campaign, you can say that without necessarily articulating exactly how, or you can even articulate how you think you're going to do it without having to worry about what really trying to implement. Yeah. I um, think that'll be actually, if, if Romney, and I think I actually think his smarter observer um, advisors realize this, and the yeah. problem of, of, you know, sort of criticizing the president and trying to make him look weak, which, you know, is, is what they feel they need to do on national security, the sort of Rovian strategy of go for, go yeah. for your opponent where he's strong, not just where he's weak. But at mm -hmm. the same time, not, I mean, Americans don't actually like the whole democracy promotion at the point of a gun thing. It doesn't pull well. And so yeah. Romney does not want to get pushed into a place where he is having to spell out sort of a concrete alternative that sounds like democracy at the point of a gun. Because that, you know, the independents no, are not going to like you, that. So, so they're, you're right, it's going to be challenging as much as, you know, certain wings of the party are spoiling to have this fight. It's, it's going to be challenging for Romney. Maybe. I mean, I, okay, if I was playing Romney advisor, I would probably say... I, I, I can think of two lines of attack. The first is to say, three lines of attack. The first is to say, this deal is dangerous. This deal reminds me of what the Obama administration did in February with North Korea, and look how long that lasted. So let's be blunt. This is a paper, you know, arrangement, you know, with a country that doesn't necessarily honor uh, anything that it, it necess uh, necessarily signs. Second, you know, this is yet further evidence that the Obama administration is out of touch with the values of the American people, um, you know, what the American people want to see is democracy in Iran. They want to see this hideous, theocratic regime that wants to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, gone. I am not saying that we should necessarily use force to do that, but we should use all available measures short of force. If sanctions brought Tehran to the bargaining table, imagine what even tougher sanctions would do to that regime. It would bring it to its knees. And you know what, finally? Isn't it really sad that this administration can sit down and compromise with Tehran, but they won't compromise with the Republicans in Congress? <laughs> so, so I am never, I am never an Obama surrogate during office hours, um, and, and we, are, we are taping this during office hours, so I am not an Obama surrogate. But um, you know, there, there was. I am not a Robbie surrogate. I know, you're you're right, pretty right, badass. Right. I thought, that um, was pretty but difficult. the IRS doesn't care what you do, and it does care. Oh, what right, I right. Do. Um, sorry, but, right. you know, the sorry. first response to that is, of course, we can't trust Tehran, and that's why it's so great that we cleverly got the IAEA deal done at the same time. So we'll have inspectors okay. back on the ground that will tell us what the, Tehran, what, what the Iranians are doing, you know, which is, which is exactly what 
the previous administration failed to do and what Governor Romney has no plan for. Um, I can't believe you're going to put your faith in UN bureaucrats, but go ahead. Go those ahead. UN, well, <laughs> then we then we then we send you know the other advisor off to the side and remind everybody that the, who the UN bureaucrats are that are doing it and yes, et cetera, yes, et cetera. But um, like but then okay. you know second point. And second point is the one, by the way, that I, as just sort of a person who favors U.S. global engagement and who favors unity and diversity in American society, I'm really concerned about because that yeah. Obama doesn't understand our values stuff is code yeah. for, you know, Obama's not one of us. He's a Muslim. Right. Maybe he was yeah. born in Kenya. Um, but, you know, the response to that is, you know, one of the things that Barack Obama understands very well is that it's much better to have UN inspectors in Iran than US troops firing guns on the ground in Iran and that Americans don't want that. That's a good line. I like that. That's actually pretty good. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, you know, my third point is going to be I just, you know, meanwhile I just like to remind you that um, every time Governor Romney goes out and talks about war with Iran, the oil futures markets jump 5% and what, the, you know, that shaves another point off the recovery that we're putting through over the objections of Republicans in Congress. You have to call that the Romney tax on oil. <laughs> I like that. I like that. There you go. See? Um, speaking of speaking I, of which, should, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to pivot to Egypt, but I, it sounds like you had one more good point to make. No, no, no. I was going to say I, I can you know offer advice to both sides. I, I you know, I, uh, can we? I, 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 I can be politically whore myself. Can we chiron your good. phone number across the bottom of the screen or something? <laughs> <laughs> I should open up a shop, a foreign policy consulting shop. I tell you, I'm under. I, ha I have to tell you, the sad part is you'd find very few takers for that. And the other little secret I have is people yeah. who want advice on foreign policy don't want to pay for it. Yes, I'm not surprised on that. That's why I'm sitting. That's why the viewers will notice that the wall behind me is white and blank. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You were going to pivot to Egypt, I believe. Yeah, I thought we should since um, they're having an yes. election today. Um, somebody had a snide mm -hmm. comment. Oh, I guess it was one of the Muslim brothers who said that the people of Egypt had been waiting 7,000 years for this day. CNN actually had a, I thought, a, a you know, if one of the rare, like, you know, cry on things that I actually thought was really cool, which was, you know, Egypt has first uh, free election in 5,000 plus years. It, it was a good line, I thought. Wait, but does that suggest Egypt actually had a free election 5,000 years ago? Forgive my forgive my ignorance about this. No, no, I don't think it does. I think it might be that CNN misdated the beginnings of the uh, the Egyptian. Era. Although I do I do recommend the um, the Stacey Schiff Cleopatra book for um, interesting reading about how much more evolved freedoms um, and particularly gender freedoms were in Cleopatra's Egypt than they were in the Roman world of the period. Which is, which is one of the reasons that the Romans found Cleopatra so highly dubious, was that girls were educated and women could choose and divorce their husbands. Oh. Well, that's just, no, I don't approve of that at all. So it's just... <laughs> but um, but the Egyptian elections are actually, I mean, one of the more fascinating things about them is that nobody, including your two blogging heads interlocutors, or maybe especially your two blogging heads interlocutors, has any freaking idea how they're going to turn out. Yes, and actually they're turning out right now as we speak, so I should stress that, you know, Probably what we're going to say is, is overtaken by events by the time the thing gets posted. Yeah. Um, I, I will say that the, the smartest thing I've seen on this was a, a, a post that my uh, co-blogger at Foreign Policy, Mark Lynch, wrote, yes. um, which has been that basically the transition has been – all the major players in the transition have acted so stupidly that this just might work. In other words, the, the, the military has committed numerous gas. The Muslim Brotherhood has committed numerous gas. The protesters, you know, the interior square misunderstood a whole variety of things. The Salafis have screwed up, you name it. And yet, oddly enough, we're actually in a really competitive election, it seems like. It, it's not a slam dunk for anyone. Yeah, and, and the, the point that I took from Mark's piece, which I also really liked, um, was what I was calling the Rip Bin Winkle point, which is that if you had fallen asleep <laughs> on um, February 11th, 2011, and yeah. woken back up, and it, oh, look, it's not much more than a year later. They're having elections. They're peaceful. Um, the candidates are very diverse. The outcome is totally unclear. Meanwhile, yeah. Egypt has a legislature, and the, um, the, the SCAF, the military rulers, are sticking to their time frame. And that actually yeah. is a pretty damn amazing transition. So um, yeah. whatever the result turns out to be, and I, I pretty much guarantee that because basically it's either going to be – um, a candidate who at some time in the present or past has had links to the Muslim Brotherhood and or a candidate who has said some nationalist things that um, American 
Americans in the domestic political context will find highly objectionable because, gosh, people never, ever say things in domestic, you know, talk about the domestic context of elections. Um, So there will be a whole lot of screaming and scare. uh, One thing I predict confidently is that there will be a lot of screaming and scaremongering about how the world is coming to an end, the Israelis should be terrified, and Barack Obama lost Egypt. Um, I think I can predict (laughs) that with great confidence. And, you know, the the point that that Mark's piece make is, is that there turns out to be actually more sort of inherent um, strength and consistency in Egyptian institutions, um, both for better and for worse. And I think some of the things that people were really hoping for in the revolution haven't come to pass for exactly these reasons. But the world is not going to end. We're not going to wake up tomorrow morning. You know, gas will not be cut off to Israel. The peace treaties will not be abrogated. Um, the canal will not be closed. Um, and, you know, you will go out to the, to the stoop tomorrow morning and the paper will still be there. Hopefully. Um, I, that last one really does date us, by the way, um, just, just so you know. But uh, I, I would tend to I, – I don't disagree with those assessments. I think the thing that stood out for me, and I think Gallup had a, a poll out this week uh, that was also significant on this point, which is I, I think what, what, was, what seemed disconcerting during the parliamentary elections and during the fall was that there seemed this sort of inexorable trend – that you know the Islamists, in particular the Salafists, were were carving out an ever greater share of you know public opinion, um, you know to the point where the Salafists did far better than anyone expected during the parliamentary elections, um, and, and that you know got a lot of uh, American watchers a little wigged out. And it turns out they've peaked and actually declined, which is interesting. Uh, I think that's the most interesting thing. Something uh, we forget is there's nothing like actually giving people power to uh, yes. to, uh, to start disaffection with them. Exactly, and so in that sense, I have to. You, you, I, th- I think you're right. I mean, one of the odd things, what you know, as it turns out, giving creating a parliament and giving these guys some responsibility in parliament was really good because it turns out this is a nice test, stress test for how are they going to handle. Uh, the presidency and then the Muslim Brotherhood screwed up by not saying they weren't going to put a candidate forward and then doing so. Um, and so on the whole, you know, the fact that the election is in doubt, I think, is the best thing that could have happened to Egypt um, because it meant that people actually cared about it uh, and that it didn't seem like it was a, the fix was in as it were. Um, and so in that sense, I think you're right that, that oddly enough, Egypt seemed relatively promising, you know, uh, in February of last year when, when Mubarak left. Then it seemed like, oh, it's not going to go the way of Tunisia. And now it actually seems, I, I think the more interesting question is, if the election goes well and if the transition continues, I think the, the two interesting questions are, first, will the new president be able to contain what SCAF wants to do? Because um, it's clear SCAF isn't going to give up, you know, all of its powers to the fight. And then second, you know, traditionally, the region has, has paid attention to Cairo. Um, and it'll be interesting to see what you know whether or not there's that kind of effect down the road. Yeah, I would I would agree. Um, although I do think that um, you may end up with a president who um, actually wants most of the same things that the SCAF wants, which will present its own whole set of challenges. That is entirely possible. But on that note, I think uh, our time has run out, and hopefully this will actually be up to date. At which I at which I blush again. Um, but uh, Daniel, it's been it's been terrific, and we will we will reconvene. Yes, always a pleasure. Take care. All right, best of luck. Oh, and the Red Sox won while we were doing this. Fan, hey, well, that clearly we need to we need to time it that way more often. Exactly. All right, take care. Take care.